बराज कर रहा है याद रखिए तो ऐसा तो हम नहीं कहेंगे कि आ, हमारा जो नॉलेज सिस्टम है वो इतना नहीं था यहाँ बढ़ा चढ़ा के करते थे ये उसका अभी का प्रमाण है दूसरा धर्मपाल जी की बात आपने की आप सबको एक किताब है उनकी भारत का स्वधर्म वैसे तो धर्मपाल को तो पढ़ना चाहिए ब्यूटीफुल ट्री इंडियन एजुकेशन सिस्टम पर उनकी किताब है लेकिन भारत का स्वधर्म एक छोटी किताब है जो मद्रास प्रेसिडेंसी के डाटा को बताती है ब्रिटिश लाइब्रेरी म्यूजियम लंदन से 20 साल उन्होंने गांधी जी के आग्रह पर जाकर वहाँ ब्रिटिश रिकॉर्ड से ही जो थे उनको सारी चीज़ें नोट की और कई चीज़ें उनको लाने की मिलती नहीं थी तो वो जो सिगरेट का या कोई ऐसा कागज ऐसे डाल के जेब पर ले जाते तो उस पर वो लिख लिख के रेफरेंस लाते थे कि मैंने आज एडम की रिपोर्ट पढ़ी अगर आप लोगों को जिनको ये लगे कि भी हमारे यहाँ कुछ था नहीं हमने कुछ बढ़ा चढ़ा के किया तो एक बार एडम की रिपोर्ट से गुजर करना चाहिए उसे पता चल जाएगा कि जब अंग्रेज यहाँ आए और एजुकेशन सिस्टम को देखा तो उनकी आंखें खुली रह गई और उन्होंने सबसे पहले कहा कि इसीलिए मैं कहा कहा कि इनका एजुकेशन बहुत तोड़ है क्योंकि तो जिस ढंग की एजुकेशन ले रहे हैं कि कोई कास्टिजम वास्टिजम नहीं थी जो हम बातें करते कोई ऐसा कुछ नहीं था बल्कि आप धर्मपाल जी ने डाटा दिया अंग्रेजों के डी डाटा है जो उन्होंने बहुत सॉलिड ढंग से इकट्ठा किए थे एडम की और उससे रिपोर्ट से उसमें गैर ग्रामीण एजुकेशन ज्यादा ले रहे हैं एक बात इंटरप्ट करना चाहूंगा हां हाँ। सिस्टम कब नहीं था कि सेंचुरी में नहीं था अरे सर अरे सर सिस्टम में नहीं था प्लीज आप नहीं टॉपिक से थोड़ा सा भटके मत वो चीज छोड़िए इसमें आंसर दोनों की तरफ से मिल जाएंगे मैं लगता है सर आपकी एक बात खत्म हो गई तो कि समय कम रह गया एक आध सवाल हम ले सकते हैं हां जी थैंकफुल टू यू हां traditional knowledge or we should go for the western and the line of the discourse is the western knowledge actually destroys the traditional this is the line of but i just want to invite your attention to the the idea of knowledge what and in the sociology discourse we call it the epistemology of knowledge what is epistemology it is nothing but how do we establish that something is knowledge right so The knowledge, the modern scientific knowledge, got its authority not by its own virtue. It's through the methodology. The authenticity of the modern knowledge established itself through its methodology, the procedure, the method through which it established itself. Right. So that gives the authenticity for the modern scientific knowledge. What we call the modern knowledge. What we had when we were talking about the historical knowledge is either intuity. Or trial and error method. These were the two methodologies which we were using to establish this knowledge system. That doesn't mean that they are not valid. I'm not contesting that they are not valid. But the point is, the, the validity, the methodology of I mean, establishing any validity of a knowledge is modern scientific knowledge, which is methodology we establish, is more acceptable because of of many reasons. One is anybody can contest it. Modern scientific knowledge has three, four characteristics. One is it is based on empirical science. You need evidence. You cannot establish any scientific knowledge on things for which you cannot provide evidences. So evidence, empiricism is very important in modern scientific knowledge. This is one thing. Second thing is its falsifiability. If you are establishing that this is knowledge. Anybody can contest it. Anybody can prove that it is, you know, false. There is an opportunity to falsification. It is viable for falsification. So, because of these two, three characteristics, it got its authenticity. That's why in Corona, why we went for uh, vaccination, why we are not uh, looking for because the method, uh, you know, we have tested on the test procedure. Okay, it will work. So, I the, the Western knowledge it originated in the West. But that's why, it, but but it was not uncontested when it was establishing Galileo or Bruno. They had to you know, sacrifice their life. It was not an easy path. They were killed. I mean, that's why the, the Christian church that time they were saying saying that the uh, Earth is the center of the universe. They challenged it. 
No, they had to lose their life. So the, the modern scientific knowledge got its glory. I mean, thali mein rakhe koi diya nahi hai. It was a political process. So just like in India also, you are telling that the foreign rulers destroyed it, Western rulers destroyed it. But who destroyed Charvaka's philosophy in India? Not Mughals, not Westerners. Who destroyed the Buddhist literature in India? Who, lit who destroyed the Buddhist literature in India? And there comes the issue of caste. And we had definitely, even in, 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 I am coming from Chhattisgarh, the tribal have a knowledge on this, you know, uh, iron, iron uh, to, to process iron, to produce you know, metals. But what happened? These knowledge, unlike in the West, where the official, the knowledge, official knowledge and the artisan knowledge were not two separate things. Many of the scientists were, I mean, go, came, came from the artisan family. But in India, this has not happened because of the caste. There, there, there lies the currents of the argument. Because the artisanical knowledge who were actually working on the field, on metals, on field, on seeds, they are not able to convey or establish the authenticity, authenticity of knowledge. Because the authorship, the authority of knowledge was the, with the thousands. And they were not knowing what is going on in the field because they never went to the field and did the agriculture or this thing. So there was a huge gap in the Indian system between the experiential knowledge and the intuitive knowledge which we are talking about, which was in the drama. And that's why I mean, what, what we, the so-called glory of India has not put, I mean, it, has, it went into shadows. So we, have, we should accept in our, and, and really accept that it, we had a great rich knowledge system. There is no doubt about it. But Boston, and to prove that, we should not say that uh, we had a history of Valmanika, this. But you see, who is contesting? The, the, in the Valmanika Purana, it is there. The structure is given, na? Last 20, 30 years we are discussing. Why nobody built a, using that drawing, why nobody is building another plane? It's a very simple question. We are still cl claiming that in Indian Purana, I mean, we, we have a uh, drawing of Vaiman, I mean, aeroplane. Uh, Why we are not bu building another one and prove it? <coughs> That's how the modern science works. If you have an argument, the burden of proof is on you. You have to give the evidence. You have to prove it. Modern science have evidence that the structure have no not following the modern uh, aerodynamics principles. Very clear. You cannot, uh, I mean, it is not following the modern aerodynamic principle. And we talked about uh, the uh, Setu. According to modern science, it is uh, coral reefs, basically. And if you have an argument that it is from the Himalayan stone, the burden of proof is on you, and you have to establish proof I mean, with, with the method of uh, science. So, I mean, that's what I'm telling. The entire, the blanket rejection of traditional knowledge won't do any help. We need to understand how do we, what the method of establishing knowledge. And we have to pass through those process, pass, pass through the process to establish what was with us, what was not with us, what went wrong with us. There should be a self-criticism what Simran Maram is talking about, rather than, you know, giving blanket, you know. Can you tell and this is my comment. Okay. Okay. So, for only one minute, I will take I have to take half a second. I mean, I will take half a second. Half a second. <laughs> half a second. <laughs> And I think when we use the caste system, we take it a step further from Michel Foucault's archaeology of knowledge, which is, as of now, the only thing that I've read on how knowledge is formed. So when we ask this, you take it one step beyond me. So when Charles was saying, uh, artisans, art and it is all knowledge with this metal, etc., it was not considered as knowledge. दूसरा बंदा सोचता है दोनों में कहा अपने आप को कंटेस्ट किया जा सकता है मुझे लगता है की अभी भी कुछ मेरी ऑब्जर्वेशन है की हम जो वेस्टर्न कैटेगरी हमें मिली है जिसमें हमारी एजुकेशन वही है हम लोग भी एक ही तरह से पढ़े हुए हैं कॉलेज सिस्टम में यूनिवर्सिटी सिस्टम में मेथडोलॉजीज को लेके टोटली हंड्रेड परसेंट वेस्टर्न कैटेगरी हमें दी गई और कहा गया कि आप इसमें फिट हो जाइए अगर आप फिट नहीं होते तो यू डोंट एग्जिस्ट है ना अगर पीएचडी का आप खास मेथडोलॉजी से रिसर्च नहीं करेंगे वैसे आप पीछे रेफरेंसेज नहीं देंगे तो रिजेक्ट कर देंगे ऐसे ही हमारे थाट्स में है 
अगर आप वैसा नहीं सोचेंगे नहीं करेंगे सो एक वेस्टर्न पैरामीटर्स है एक्चुअली कहीं ना कहीं हमें इतना रिजिट नहीं होना चाहिए बेसिकली मुझे लगता है अक्सर ने भी वेस्टर्न या मॉडर्निज्म को कंटेस्ट नहीं किया डिनाई नहीं किया लेकिन इतना जरूर है कि ट्रेडिशन को जो आउटराइटली रिजेक्ट किया गया ना उसको अब कंटेस्ट करना बनता है कि सब कुछ बुरा नहीं है आ सिस्टम जाति प्रथा आती है कौन नहीं जानता बुरा है डेफिनेटली बुरा है उसको आप तभी एड्रेस कर पाएंगे जब उसके बारे में बात करेंगे रिजेक्ट करना भी बुरा है अगर आप रिजेक्ट कर दिए तो उसका मतलब उसको आप तो उसको डिस्कशन में नहीं लाना चाहते उसको आप सोचिए विचार करिए उसमें से कैसे निकलना है तो ट्रेडिशन में से तो प्रेजेंट में तभी आप आएगा जब उसको हम रिजोल्व कर लेंगे तो रिजोल्व वाला भी जो है ना एक आजकल एक वीडियो कुछ दिनों से हफ्ते में चल रहा है कि कैसे उसको किसी मूवीज को क्या हो सो एनी बहुत अच्छा लगा आज की चर्चा में और अच्छी बातें अच्छे विचार I feel very uh, privileged to be chairing uh, the session for uh, such an eminent scholar, Dr. Karan Singh. Uh, Dr. Karan Singh is uh, principal and associate professor at Government College for Women, Pali District, Rivali, Haryana. Uh, Dr. Karan Singh has uh, completed three successful UGC projects, and just in December last year, he completed the project with ICSSR. Uh, the biodata extends to two pages. Uh, it's a very illustrious biodata. I will try and shorten it. Um, Sir has, uh, of course, got a fellowship with the IIAS and also has been an affiliated fellow at the International Institute of Asian Studies, Leiden, in the Netherlands. Publications run into a uh, book. Publications run into ten uh, into ten uh, books altogether. Uh, with the latest, which was in 2020 from Rutledge, UK, an extremely prestigious publisher. The number of select articles in foreign journals, and 29 articles in national journals, and 13 chapters in books. Seminars and conferences, uh, papers have been presented in 16 national and international seminars and conferences, um, with visits to Turkey, the USA, and Malaysia, in international conferences. Uh, for today, we will be listening to Sir's presentation on uh, the topic, Sacralizing Soldier, Dynamics of Collective Memory in Syncretic Shrines. Over to Dr. Kalev. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, should I begin? Sure. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. I am very grateful for, uh, to IIAS for giving me an opportunity to be here. This is my last spell and uh, the institute has, has given me a lot of things. So uh, let me start with my paper. Uh, the title is uh, Sacralizing Soldier, Dynamics of Collective Memory in Sympathetic Strikes. The paper relates uh, a peculiar phenomenon which I observed in uh, certain parts of India. The phenomenon is that there is a shrine, a Muslim saint's shrine, and when we go into the past of that saint, we find that uh, this saint was a soldier who fought with an army, mostly uh, with Hindu kings, was killed in the action, a tomb was made over, over the place where he fell, and slowly that tomb was converted into a bigger structure by a Hindu a tradesman or some other person and slowly people started worshipping him as a saint and he lost his religious affiliations and was converted into a syncretic saint which was worshipped more by Hindus than Muslims because the field studies which I had done in Haryana and Rajasthan there uh, most of the Muslim population has disappeared after partition so he became a saint a syncretic saint and is worshipped by Hindus as a Peer, Peer Baba. So it, it led me to thinking about the role of collective memory and how it is transformed in a society and how a soldier figure is converted into the figure of a saint. So I begin. Uh, I assert that the boundary line between a warrior and a saint within popular culture 
this quite thin and is crisscrosses through a sheer sacred landscape. Although in modern Western culture, they are often part of a dichotomy between the sacred and the profane, the material and the transcendent, in traditional cultures, warriors and saints converse together in their inhabiting of a utopian space and an arena of the uncommon. Within the syncretic culture of tradition, which I mean, mean uh, as a hybrid culture consisting of two different, two or more than uh, two different communities coming together to share a sacred scape, the warrior sits quite comfortably with his saintly counterpart, and the movement between these spheres is what keeps him religiously relevant and a figure of veneration to changing dynamics of power. It is to be noted that an alliance between the temporal and the spiritual authority within the ancient cultures of the world <coughs> is not uncommon. If within Western culture it becomes apparent in the coalition of the Pope and the King to reformation, within India the kings often proclaim themselves as protector of dharma, thus assigning themselves the attributes of spiritual authority. It is undeniable, however, that Brahmins, the priestly class, were often found in clash with the usurpation of their self-proclaimed rights by the kings and the ensuing conflicts between the Kshatriyas and the Brahmins within the history of Hinduism are an integral part of this separation. This alliance between the temporal and the spiritual authority is also integral to Sikhism, Jainism and Buddhism where the separation between these two is denied and both of these spheres get associated within the figure of an ideal king. The present paper seeks to look not into the dynamics of alliance between the temporal and spiritual as revealed in modern and ancient cultures of the world, but rather focuses on the transformation of a warrior belonging to an invading army into a syncretic saint under the dynamics of encounter between two disparate cultures. The cultural context selected for the present study are popular Hinduism and Islam, particularly in its Sufi version. And the field of study is limited to some selected syncretic shrines currently existing in Haryana and Rajasthan. The inferences, however, have trans-regional applications as similar shrines exist in different parts of India and there exists a com commonality of situation, purpose, and trajectory of such shrines. It is proposed that a shift in the identity of a warrior into a saint is part of a syncretic cultural context in which a reformulation in the collective memory of both the cultures take place. This paper takes its theoretical positioning from the stand taken by Aleida Hesman that the significance of collective memory lies not how it is constructed, but how it is used in a social context. I will leave the quotation. Some of the markers of the study are the religious and material needs for reformulation of the sacred, the process of integration of the invading culture with the recipient one, and the dynamics of collective memory in both the communities in this realignment. For the purpose of this paper, invading culture represents the cultural, ethnic, and religious background of the warrior from which he enters into a recipient culture. The words invading and recipient have been used here in the dynamic sense of their interchangeability with an awareness that invading and recipient do not always connote agency and passiveness and that these roles can shift under varying historical and political situations. So these are certain denials or negatives which I have taken in this paper. Now the case studies, Meera Meherban and Peace of Ghatshida, within the ruined port of Prithviraj in Hasi, an old city in Haryana, at a distance of around 140 kilometers from Delhi, there is a small shrine belonging to Hazrat Meer Niyamatullah near the north side of the world of port, which is now known by the name of Meera Mehrban, Sat Sahib, Baba Sultan Sahib, or in short form as Meera Mehrban. The shrine is not very well maintained. Although many people visit it during the month of Bhadra, the Kavali programs and Bhandara are regularly organized by the Sevadar, who is a non-Muslim, and artists from different parts of Haryana give their presentation before the Baba Meera Mehrban, Sat Sahib. Within the precincts of the shrine lies a yogi shrine of Jogadas Ji Maharaj. Along with them, there is a third shrine of Guruji Swami Ramanandji Maharaj close by, 
consisting of an ochre clad statue and a separate enclosure with stone floor just near the complex of these shrines. A reference to Hazrat Mir Niyamatullah is found in the Gazetteer of Haryana, which notes, the Muslim conquest of Hasi is attested to by the mausoleum at the northern end of Mount of Shah Niyamatullah, who, although successfully led the attack in conquering the fort, was himself killed in the action. The pilgrims going to Bogamiri, another syncretic shrine in Rajasthan, representing a warrior turning into a Muslim saint, first visit the shrine of Niram Hirman before proceeding further. Most of the worshippers visiting the shrine are Hindus, as Muslims left us in large numbers during and after partition. The signboard at the entrance of the shrine complex proclaims Darga Mandir Kela Hasi, which does not appear an oxymoron to the devotees who seek in the peer a solution of their day-to-day -day problems. Two other lines on the inner gate of the shrine in in their invocation to the sacrality, reveal the interpenetration of multiple faiths more accurately. To me, Mere Malik, to me, Mere Meera, to me, Mere Sultan Ram, to me, Ho Uzira. You are my owner, you are my Meera, you are my King Ram, you are my illumination. Further, another verse creates this amalgamation through images and divinities borrowed from diverse traditions of faith. Malik Meera Mehirman, Sunyo Arz Awaz, Anjo Rakho sees per Yam Nain Hoth Kiras. O benevolent King Nira, listen to my petition. Keep your hand on my head so that death won't be calamitous. The words and imagery in these lines reveal an eclectic vision in which concepts and personages from both Islamic and Hindu worlds are chosen and mixed together. This revealing composite nature of the supplication. The coexistence of yogi and Islamic shrines reveal in a concrete way the commingling and sustenance of these traditions. The pillars close to the shrine have intricate design with human figures entwined, covering with a distant part of the fort within Hindu oblique Zen architecture, which may have been used by Islamic conquerors. There is a swastika symbol on the gate of the inner shrine of the Mira, Mira Sahib, in whose four hands the symbols of Om cross and crescent moon are imprinted, thus creating a oneness of diverse religious traditions. The second uh, shrine which I visited in 2010, nearly 10 kilometers from the port of Hasi and scattered in nearby places, there are many shrines of Turk soldiers who were killed during the attack on the fort by Muhammad Ghori. One such small dilapidated shrine situated within the fields is known as Ganji Shahida or Ghadsida which is the modern name. This shrine, which is reported to be belonging to a slain soldier of Muhammad Ghori's army, has become a source of veneration for nearby blazes. The shrine remains abundant for the most part of the year and is taken care of by non-Muslim blazes. Those desiring a boon for common misfortunes such as diseases, childlessness, etc., visit the shrine and pay obeisance to the saint. This is the photo there, Mira Mirwan Sat Sahib, Jai Baba Sultan Sahib. This is the outer gate. This is the second inner gate where we have swastika symbol and other uh, symbols there. This is the inner sanctum sanctorium where multiple figures taken from uh, different traditions are visible. This is the inner view of uh, the Garshida shrine, which is unkempt now, it's not very well clear. And this is how this shrine is situated in the fields of Master. Third uh, case study which I have taken is Hazrat Sayyid Ahmad Hazir Shakarwar. The shrine of Hazrat Sayyid Ahmad Hajib Shakarwal is situated in Narhat town near Chadawa, Rajasthan, around 180 kilometers from Delhi. The shrine belongs to Hajib Shakarwal, who was born in 1380 and was son of a famous Ismaili Nizari saint, Samshuddin Sabzuwari. He got his name for causing a rain of sugar on the request of a devotee, Sabzuwar. He accompanied Dawa missions, which are preaching and conversing type of missions undertaken by Islamis, missions with a large Lashkar 
and was assigned border area, uh, area of Rajasthan, close to Haryana, by his father for his preaching missions. He was killed in 1302 by offering the night prayers in his conflict with Raja Sripal of Nahar, the Nahar king, Nahar Zat king, when he was attacked in the night by the army of the king. Raja Sripal was later killed by the Muslim army, which won the town, and he named it as Nahar Sharif. The shrine was built by Hindu tradesmen in 1445. He was impressed by the reign of sugar around the grave of the saint. The tradesmen later adopted Islam and became the first Imam of the newly built shrine. The Dargah of Hajib, Hajib Shakarbar Shah is now attended by both Hindus and Muslims who seek relief from various ailments from the saint. There is no Sajda Nishin of the shrine representing a discontinuity in historical ownership and its standalone nature. The present Khadim, caretaker of the shrine, is Hazi Azim Khan Pathan, and the clientele of the shrine comprises both Hindus and Muslims. The Darga specializes in the treatment of lunacy, and the soil of the Darga called Khak Asipa is considered efficacious in removing lunacy when rubbed over the body. The suit taken from the land in the Darga is considered effective in removing diseases of dyes. The shrine is well known for its custom of celebrating Krishna's and Mastumi together by both Hindus and Muslim communities. A large fair is organized on the occasion of Krishna's and Mastumi in which devotees from Rajasthan, Gujarat, Haryana, Punjab and Madhya Pradesh participate. A performance of Khyal is organized along with the night visit Rath Zaga on the occasion. The rites such as sacrifice of air of newborn children, Zudala Uttarwana, Sanctification of first milk of a cow or buffalo, along with tying of clothes, threads to a tree symbolizing fulfillment of wishes are undertaken by devotees here. So this is uh, Hazim Sakarbar's shrine. In our... Now I come to analysis of these case studies based on uh, a kind of uh, framework I have taken. The trajectory of these chains from warriors of faith and conquerors situated firmly within the ethnic, religious, and regional and religious context of Islam to syncretic saints belonging to both the communities with the majority of devotees from Hinduism passes through the terrain of collective social memory and its transformation into varying social political conditions. As the continued popularity of these shrines and their shift from the locus in the invading culture to the host one passes through an understanding of how collective social memory is liable to transform itself, the study utilizes developments in social and collective memory studies within Western scholarship, which traces its genesis in the works of Uzo Bon Menstel, Maurice Haubach, and Abby Warburg. Studies in collective memory and its generational transmutation have been undertaken by historians such as Mary Peterson, Bernard and Thomas Connelly, through, although their focus has been on the secular examples of modern era. Overwatch, Les Cadre, Socialix, De La Memoir, and Topography, Legendaire des Evangelii, more closely examine the process of modern history through a social group's relation to memories and how perspectives on Christianity change with doctrinal and political shifts. Ira Nora's distinction between memory and history, in between memory and history, less lyrics the memory, is based on history as being a partial, locational understanding of the past, while memory in its dynamic, lively impression of the events finds past and present in the organic way. So there has been a criticism in which history is considered a less reliable tool less compared to the, the memory, the collective memory field. I'll skip this quotation. What is relevant for the present study is an understanding of collective memory as a contested field due to its ability to reinterpret and reclassify historical events. Edward W. Said, in Invention, Memory, and Place, notices this aspect of memory when he asserts collective memory is not an inert and passive thing, but a field of activity in which past events are selected, reconstructed, maintained, modified, and endowed with political meanings. Another important critical tool having relations with the shaping of these syncretic saints is the way history is written, transmitted, and understood. The conception of stereography under current scholarship as a moving positionality on a scale of the subjective experiences of a narrator 
and the outside realm of monuments, artifacts, etc., makes it difficult to distinguish real from the imagined. The kind of uh, discussions we were having just now, that even within history, it is very difficult to differentiate what is real from what is imagined. Within religious traditions, as historical memories of the events are determined not by an historical truth, but by consensus bestowed by their durability. Usually, it is supposed that history is factual and you know, memory is uh, subjective. But nowadays, it is contested. It is, it, is, it is being positive that even history is subjective experience based on so many factors. In discussions on truth or big false dialectic on collective memories, a later estimate in transformations between history and memory refers to the constructiveness of all historical memories and points out that what is more important is what they do in a social culture space than their configuration. The persistence of the memories of syncretic saints within the cultural landscape of India can further be related to what Yeru Shalami comments in relation to the Jews. Collective memory is drastically selective. Certain memories live on, the rest are winnowed out, repressed, or simply discarded by a process of natural selection, which the historian uninvited disturbs and reverses. The selective and reordering re attributes of collective memory, which are facilitated by the notion of imagined traditions and the value of historiography in the rendering of factual knowledge, plays a key role in the transformation of these warrior figures into saintly ones. Collective memory does not depend on the factuality of the events. Rather, the position of the event person in the network of historical developments gives them a durability and relevance. I'll skip this quotation. That is why the significance of the foreign warrior and his transformation into a saint does not lie within the originating incident of the sacrifice. It lies in his relationship with his community, is used as a symbol of bravery, and later on as a saint. The selective transformative function of collective memory becomes visible in these saints under the observation that in their transmutation from warriors to saints, only certain attributes, such as their piety and religiosity, were transferred to the saintly figures while relegating their participation in wars and their hatred for the non-Muslims to the arena of amnesia. This view of collective memory as a dynamic process in which old beliefs are reshaped and reconfigured makes one of the vantage point to understand the changing dynamics of syncretic science at Hasi and Narada. One important factor which ensures the longevity of syncretic saints and places them firmly within the collective memory of the society is the timely creation of a mausoleum or the graves of these fallen heroes. The point which I am insisting here is that in a certain way the memories were able to be kept in collective memory of the society because of timely construction of a tomb over the fallen warriors. This tomb was later reshaped by, further by, of course, people belonging to different uh, communities. But initially, the tomb which was put over, put over the place where these warriors fell helped in sustaining the memories of these heroes. This is one point I'm making here in this paragraph. Alongside the role of concretization of memory by the doom and the tomb, the longevity of any cultural memory of a hero depends on the intensity, intensity of the emotions the persona oblique event is able to evoke in the society. The second factor which I'm insisting is that these people continue to live in the memory of memory of people is because of the intensity of emotion which was attached with the event. The events which find an easy path into social and collective memories are offered either about the cataclysmic events or repeated incidents, while in the former the accidents of man-made and natural are included, in the later category the life cycle events and the seasonal cycles can be included. So such incidents remain longer in collective memory, but along with them, along with these two, another category of persons and their action is also included within the storehouse of collective memories. These persons are often part of heroic attributes, which did something spectacular. It can be seen that moral action, morality is not important for collective memory. What is important is something sudden, something drastic. So it can be seen that moral actions, if, if it to be part of collective memory, would have to be something drastic and out of the ordinary. Thus it is easy to see 
that social memory needs something appealing and extraordinary to be remembered. It should be noted that within Islam, traditional Islam, which I mean scriptural Islam, the figure of warrior is entwined with that of a saint in Islam. In scriptural Islam, there is no differentiation between the warrior and the saint. Sainthood in scriptural Islam is both a condition and product of warriorhood. The identification can be seen even in the case of Sufi saints, many of which actively participated in wars and saw it as their religious duty. Most of them accompanied the marching armies, blessed the warriors, and it was only after the dust of battle was settled that the work for peaceful negotiations within the community began. Although here too, the community was largely identified with Muslims, so there, there can be no struggle with this fact. Sudhir Kakar in the Colors of Violence comments that uh, in medieval period, even the Sufis, with all their religiosity, with all their piousness, they participated in the war. Post, and much of their work was limited to their own community. So it was only after their death that most of them acquired the status of a syncretic saint, extending his influence to cover the recipient community too. Thus, in a way, saints of Garshida, Mira Mehrwan, Shakarwar share their popularity with Sufi saints in that they attained their recognition in the recipient community after death, which brought about a major change in their acceptance through a reorientation towards syncretization. Thus, the transformation of a common soldier into a revealed figure passes through a sudden and violent death. This is very important. The passage to sainthood passes through a sudden and violent death. Along with the display of bravery and often willing acceptance of death, Blackburn identifies three prerequisites for deification of a hero in the collective memory. First, the death must be premature an end that cuts short a person's normal life span. Second and more important, the death must be violent, an act of aggression or a sudden blow from nature. Many deified heroes are killed in battle, some in less glorious conflicts, other commit suicide. Lastly, the, the death that deifies is undeserved. So if you want to be remembered in collective memory, there should be a death, that death should be sudden, and it should be uninvited. It means you embrace the death willingly. The person killed is an innocent, often fated victim. The suddenness of tragic event, coupled with the violence of the event, makes the warrior share some shades of supernaturalism. So when a warrior <coughs> is killed suddenly and willingly, so he attains certain attributes of supernaturalism. As supernatural in its essentials involves an incomprehensibility and an unpredictability, the cessation of life which in itself an unpredictable event, an obstruction in the even, even flow of life creates an affinity akin to supernatural in the death. Further, though all deaths contain within themselves an element of shock and unbelief, what makes the death of a warrior different from all such losses in common life is the calmness and acceptance of death shown by the warrior. Uh, yes. Thus, the calmness and acceptance, when combined with the suddenness of the event, gives an aura to the warrior figure, which is not different from that of worn by saint. So here, saint and warriors come close together. Both accept death. For them, death is acceptable. So here, both of them take an aura of supernaturalism because of this close affinity. The persistence of the memories of the warriors and saints in human societies is linked with an innate desire in human beings to seek interventions in supernatural. The memory of both the warriors and the saints relies on some powerful impulses in a community to transgress death, either through a challenge to it or through supplication to it. Though the motive of challenge is an important part, its inability to provide an alternative and a solace makes the saintly way a far better option and thus a more sustainable one. All the both, the warrior and the saint, challenge death. But death is overcome by a saint in the sense that he provides an alternative, an alternative universe, a heaven, <coughs> while the warrior does not provide such an option. Another factor which exists in consonance with a sudden death and a willing surrender to it thus bringing it to the to, to, to close to supernaturalism is that the heroes, both of warrior types and saintly ones, will have a more durability in collective memory if they are somehow connected with the aspirations and identity of the community. 
This is another another argument which I'm taking here that to be to exist in a collective memory, the saint should be connected with the aspirations and identity of the community. How he does it? He does it by becoming a part of popular culture, by solving the problems of people. It's not done on the transcendental level, but on the level of common people. So, I'm leaving this uh, quotation. Why evaluating the reasons for selection of certain events for persistence in its cultural memory against many? Andreas Cash J makes a comment which can be used to shed important light on the issue, where he says that uh, generally we can better record unexpected, spectacular, shocking events, but only events which remain relevant and due as memories because they brought about significant changes in people's lives. And they have been used in fashioning of a positive image of the community. It can be argued that for the rural clientele of syncretic saints in India, what really mattered was their ability to intervene successfully in the lives of people through miracles, effecting cure of diseases, bestowing of sons, and exorcising of malevolent spirits than either their religious affiliations or spiritual and ethnic, ethical transcendence. Uh, okay, then there is a quotation about Mohammedan saints of Punjab, wherein O'Brien notices that uh, they are worshipped because, because, because not because they are five poets, but because of their magical powers and because, uh, because they are able to intervene in the lives of people. It is also clear from this point that a saint as being better equipped to intervene in the lives of common people stands a better chance to live in the collective memory of people. That's why this transformation takes place. Because a saint is able to intervene more effectively in the lives of common people. Hence, a transformation from a soldier to a saint is sustained due to its greatest longevity and stability. Another argument, another strength which needs understanding due to its influence on the persistence of syncretic figures developing from a warrior is the critical role played by emotions of loss and sorrow in perpetuating those myths. As I have argued earlier also, there must be some, some intense emotion. And that intense emotion in the sense of in the sense of these heroes and, and saints is the sense of loss and sorrow. Uh, the memories of loss and sorrow which play a part in the construction of a nation and community are also related to the longevity of collective memory of syncretic saints. Their tragic death provides a spur and a gist for their persistence in social memory. The dargahs of saint soldiers, saints are needed to create a community of believers which receives encouragement from these sacrifices. <coughs> Additionally, next paragraph. Additionally, the transformation of a warrior into a saint reveals the ability of the recipient community to transform uncomfortable truths into a useful tool. So this is where the society comes into play. Society changes, transforms uncomfortable truths into a useful tool. Often studied under the dynamics of colonialism, it can be argued that the power of mimesis operates in all these contexts which involves an asymmetrical relationship of power. Whenever there is a dominant category over a subordinate category, the subordinate category resists. And it makes changes, it makes adjustments in such a way that it very surreptitiously changes the makeup of the dominant community. When the politically and militarily powerful Islam made inroads into Hinduism, the native religions were constrained to adopt some of the religious terminology and transmute it in the process as a defensive reaction of survival and resistance. The process of the adoption of a warrior seen in terms of conquest, usurpation, and rule into a saint of piety, benevolence, <coughs> and magnanimity for all woes and assertion of the power of the weak against politically and militarily powerful invading culture. So this was assertion of the power of the weak. In this transference, the invading culture slowly loses its disruption of normative life and is slowly immersed within the arena of the miraculous. The warriors often shift to the sphere of the miraculous, becoming saints with capacity to intervene in the arena of the supernatural. In this process, the ethnic identity is neglected and the fallen warrior becomes akin to the group of indigenous deities. So there is a great parallel in this transformation with 
the transformation of indigenous deities within Hinduism. Uh, many indigenous uh, tribal heroes were converted into, into uh, deities in the pantheon of Hinduism in the same process in which these uh, Muslim saints are, Muslim warriors are being converted into saints. So, in this movement from a mercenary serving the interests of a particular ethnic community to a sainthood with followers from different communities, the soldiers' original motivations were selectively forgotten and were led <coughs> over with spiritual ones. In most of such cases, the ethnic background is preserved by the caretakers, though the devotees have only a very nebulous idea of such affiliations. Okay, in another paragraph, I have talked about correspondences between the aboriginal deities and the syncretic saints, which I, which I will skip over. Okay. Yes. Next paragraph, or uh, next issue. One of the issues related to the popularity of syncretic shrines is their very is their very nature as part of alien culture and exotica. Despite being part of syncretic milieu for long, the distinctiveness of Islamic culture as revealed in the dress, rites, and food habits have maintained a separate identity as part of their cultural milieu. The Islamic saints and the rites related to them carry within them a notion of different cosmology. Air, uh, a critic argues that Muslim saints are worshipped within Hinduism because of their being Rakshasas, akin to Rakshasas, not exactly Rakshasas, akin to Rakshasas. And if I remember correctly, the same point was made about the popularity of Salman Khan, Khan brothers within the Bollywood. Why people are so much attracted to them? Because Muslim identity represents a kind of exotica, brotherness, which appeals as well as repels in the mind. So the same argument is made here, that uh, there is a bit of alienness about these shrines, which attracts as well as resists the Hindu religiosity. Uh, okay. I will just come to conclusion now, because uh, I have taken this time. Conclusion. In all the cases of Shakarbar, Mira Mehrwan, and Harshida, the warriors originally belonged to the invading community, which was militarily more powerful than the recipient community at the time of the encounter between the two. That is why the figure of the warrior was more important to the invading community, initially, which commemorated it within its cultural, its, its communal memory. But at the same time, the warrior figure was ill-fitted within the cultural repertoire of the recipient community. <coughs> And to be successfully integrated into the micro religious worldview, a transformation in the fallen hero was required. Further, the immortality of the fallen hero in the host community could only be possible through his integration into the sacred space. Since within the hinterlands of India, most of the Muslims belong to rural or lower caste spectrum before their conversion, the transmutation of warrior into a saint was in conformity with the religio cultural space of popular Hinduism. While for the recipient culture, due to the role of Sufi saints in conversion of a large number of followers into Islamic fold, and the structural similarities between the Sufis and yogic or popular Hinduism, the assimilation of the fallen hero into its sacred fold was both easy and natural. For the members of invading culture, both due to acculturation into large, larger popular Hinduism and the loss of political power in the reorganized political economic scenario, the attributes of warriors slowly, slowly became less important and the saintly qualities accentuating his role and life before his death in the clash became more pronounced. To say it is not to deny the co-presence of saintly warrior qualities in his persona, but only to emphasize the slippage of the persona from one set to another and the foreground, foregrounding of requisite qualities in the cultural space as per social and religious needs of other societies. The transformation in the collective memory related to Hajib Shakarbar, Mira Shahid, and the unknown soldier in Ashtika <coughs> seem to have taken place through its modification by selective amnesia about the conflictual elements and the foregrounding of shared elements. It reveals that the multiplicity of identities implicit within an incoming culture are taken note of by a recipient culture and the political clashes often become less important with time. The adoption of cosmology of the invading culture 
passes through selective remembering of those aspects such as violent death and sacrifice which appeal to the imagination of the recipient culture. These elements supersede the sectarian conflicts between religious systems and the filtering acts in consonance with the spread of beliefs in supernatural elements from one cultural unit to another. This sharing in the power of the divine through elevation of suffering and problems of life reveals the ability of human communities to overcome their political, religious and other mundane divergences. A movement from a warrior figure to a saintly persona is hence part of an ability shared by cultures existing together in a geographical plane to adapt, adopt and survive. It is also a tribute to human communities to overcome singular political identities and relocate themselves onto a shared conception of the supernatural on the level of popular needs. The syncretic ethos are revealed in these shrines, as revealed in these shrines, <coughs> represent a loosening of the secular political concerns towards a shared divinity. At the same time, there lies within them an uneasy figure of a warrior symbolizing a past of conflicts and seeds of a future of such a future again whenever a monochromatic vision of the multiple identities becomes dominant. <coughs> Thank you, Karam sir. That was an extremely nuanced and very well researched paper. I personally really admire the vast body of scholarship that you have brought to bear upon the topic. Uh, as chair, I get the first right to ask the question. Um, I just wanted to know, uh, let, uh, it's like, <coughs> we always thought that, uh, that's how we've been, uh, we were taught history that uh, syncretism came from the top. Like Akbar was syncretic. Maharaja Ranjit Singh was syncretic. You know, the rulers were syncretic. But your paper puts it into a completely different context. Syncretism came from the ground upwards. I. That was something that struck me and of course the fluidity of identity. So I just uh, looking at this fluidity of identity, once the soldier, fallen soldier becomes a sense to the saint, everything disappears. The ethnicity, the, I mean, his identity comes on to a transcendental level where these human factors don't matter then. When we are in our world, our ethnicity is so important. Ethnicity, the class, but once these are the level of the same, those are disappeared. Again, which goes to show the fallibility of this. How much? I mean, we're fighting over ethnicity today. Right. So I. Uh, the two I things. And the floor is open for questions yeah. too. Please. <laughs> <laughs> will you answer, or will you first take the other questions? Uh, How would you I'll answer? Just in a simple sentence, that in the last line, I've said that there sits very uncomfortably the figure of warrior into the saint. Whenever political, economic, social conditions change, the warrior figure is put out. There is always that possibility. Yes. So it's not gone. It's not gone. Thank you very much. Manas? Uh, thank you, sir, <coughs> for your wonderful presentation because I could relate it with uh, uh, popular religious culture of Bengal, because you know that uh, Bengal undivided and divided in <coughs> both cases. Uh, there is a mixed community and uh, it's a syncretic religious culture there. And peace and you know, Dargah's peace. And uh, one formulation of you, I uh, really you know, appreciate that. Uh, to an extent inspired from Subhikatra. That lost Sarno Morni, you know, also Freud uh, wrote that in Morni and then I'll put the other. Lost Sarno uh, Morni, two mysticism, in Indian context, particularly in Asian context, in many ways. Right? That lost sorrow, lost sorrow Morni leads to certain areas of mysticism where, uh, you know, that Morni for a time being at least, resolves that uh, uh, religious otherness. Right. Maybe it is temporary. Right. So uh, this, uh, I mean, uh, the last part which you discussed on otherness, 
that I uh, found slightly straight-jacketed, you know. Uh, uh, it's a very complicated paper. Uh, uh, we need to uh, once again read it. And uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, Salman Khan, the image of Salman Khan. Uh, what would uh, you say about uh, Dilip Kumar and Mudhubala? They were not known to common people as in their Muslim names. And they are known as their screen name taken, uh, you know, uh, as Dilip Kumar and Mudhubala. Uh, but they, are, they were hugely popular. Their popularity is, uh, you know, no one is as popular as Dilip Kumar in Indian popular cinema context. And, you know, there are several other factors, uh, micro, macro, broad, subtle, uh, related to the performing arts, the theory of performing arts, and how the performance and popular culture, they, are inter they interact with one another. So, for, uh, I think the Salman Khan comment which you made, <laughs> uh, uh, that can be, you know, uh, revisited that point. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. Actually, it was not included. Salman Khan is not included in my paper. <laughs> <laughs> I was just reading about uh, so Veer passing, Mahesh, passing comment. Passing, passing comment because I was uh, reading uh, a comment of a critic about the popularity of Veer Padsha in Gwalior. He's a Sophie saint. He's also converted from warrior to a saintly figure. And the critic, and I totally do not uh, agree. I, I do, do, totally do not agree with him. He says that why he thinks us why this, this particular person is popular in Hindus, why so many Hindus visit his Darga. And then he makes a comment that it must be because of that Rakshasha qualities within him. So it got me thinking, Rakshasha, I did not agree that people go to Sufi Saints because they feel that he is a Rakshasha. It is not like that. But then it connected me with the aboriginal deities, which aboriginal deities like uh, Katushan in Rajasthan, mm -hmm. who was Barbarika, uh, mm -hmm. son of Gadot Kachar, mm -hmm. Babruwan, who was again son of, uh, son of uh, a princess from Manipur, mm -hmm. and then again uh, another son of, uh, who was uh, Aravan, Aravan in Tamil Nadu, I think, mm -hmm. Aravan in Tamil Nadu was, mm -hmm. who was son of Arjuna. All those were aborisans. And now Katushan in Rajasthan, Sikha district, is a very popular figure. And he, he was killed. Interesting thing is, he was killed by Krishna. He was killed by Krishna. And uh, why he was killed? Because uh, Katot Kacha, uh, he saved. He saved uh, Abhimanyu from, uh, he saved, whom, whom does he save in, in Mahabharata? Katot Kacha saved Arjuna from Karna when he had a Shakti. The interesting thing is that when Katot Kacha was killed, there is a reference that Krishna started dancing. So all Pandvas were very agitated and they asked why he is dancing. Very much justified and then, ah, yes, then he said that he was, he was dancing because Gatot Kacha was an Akshar. Uh -huh. And if Karna had not killed him, I would have to kill him myself. So this is very uneasy kind of thing. Rakshasas, they were useful, they were assimilated, but still they were not given the due, due place within the Aryan government. So, and, and slowly, so many of these Rakshasas, as Khatushyam and other people <coughs> show, they have been assimilated within the popular culture. They are now being worshipped. Millions of uh, devotees go to visit them. So, somehow I got connected from Mir Bhatshah's example to the example of our original deities, which were assimilated within the culture of Hinduism. <coughs> and I just read about Salman Khan in the newspaper. <laughs> I totally do not agree. He is a fantastic man. Thanks. Actually, uh, Dr. Rego had raised his hand earlier. Can ah, we have you? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shuran Singh. It's a very good paper, especially in the context, today's context, where the society is torn by religious fundamentalism. Uh, a certain syncretic outlook to our practices brings in a bit of a respite. I know a shrine in Chikmangar in Karnataka, which used to be very popular among Hindus, the Hindu uh, Darga of the Muslims. And all uh, Christians, Hindus, Muslims visited that. It's about for the about till about six, seven years ago. It was a very famous one. 
and suddenly it has become a bone of contention. And I suppose we need to highlight such practices among the common people where we can bring people together instead of uh, organized religions dividing. Uh, a couple, you know, and other thing is about our memory studies. It's a big study, you know. It's an emerging uh, you know, discipline in a big way in the West. Somehow in India, it has not yet uh, picked up big. Though Indian society is deeply religious and uh, based on the scriptures, which are actually the products of memory. Though we call it Shruti, it's nothing. Uh, Shruti comes from Smriti. Okay, so therefore we need to have that, you know, those studies which, ma which will uh, definitely uh, inform our own living, our own um, interrelations. Uh, one, a couple of questions I have, uh, uh, clarifications to make. One is why you are talking about a Muslim soldier fallen and then uh, worshipped by uh, Hindus or say uh, common people. Say, you know, when, uh, when if it is a question of uh, protecting a king or a shrine or something, I suppose there will be a big, larger, a larger uh, congregation of men. Uh, not only a Muslim would be slain, but probably also uh, in, in protecting a shrine, protecting a king, probably there also others will be uh, fallen, others will be sacrificing their lives. Why only a Muslim soldier is picked by the common, uh, by a uh, collective memory to be uh, to be kept alive? Uh, one. The other thing is in the same context. You talk one of the uh, demands of that soldier being turned into a saint is a calm demeanor at the face of death. Now that is the question. Is I suppose from the previous uh, uh, session we get is also on uh, talk uh, about the. Uh, evidence, the witness to that, to that calm demeanor, where does that come from and who bears witness to this, to a calm demeanor of a fallen saint. A third thing is about your bringing in a certain transcendental element and bringing, uh, you are trying to distinguish that from the common people. Now, transcendental is a metaphor, a metaphysical category. Okay. Uh, why do you uh, why do you, you know, uh, juxtapose that with the common people? Okay, and the last one is, uh, you know, you're talking about uncomfortable truths. Uh, I, I missed that, what, which, which uncomfortable truths we're referring to in yours. Okay, and last one, the very last one, of course, you know, Dr. Manas Singh, Manas Ghosh was speaking about, though you said that it is the last one, you know, you seem to be, into a brought it Salman Khan and the Khans of uh, Bollywood just by way of that, but you, in your answer you seemed quite uh, convinced of that. Uh, but somehow, you know, uh, if that be the case, I once said I do have an issue with that. Say, for example, it's not only the uh, actors like that who are not only who are attractive and repelling. Now, now that uh, that binary is of late, not of uh, uh, ancient. It's, it doesn't come from our uh, what is that our centuries of uh, living together. No, it is recent. It is just a few, probably few decades, or uh, maybe at the most probably you know in the context of partition and beyond and recent, not be, before that. Why, why, why is that? Uh, you know, uh, no, you are quoting also the author of the one author who brings in that. I don't. I somehow I find a bit out of place. I have forgotten certain questions, but whatever, whatever I remember, I will try to answer. Uh, I agree with your last point that uh, this categorization of uh, rather uh, imposition of Rakshasa figure into old Muslims is a recent one. Can be recent one because of the changed political, social, and cultural conditions in which two communities are pitted together against one another and kind of figure is being cultivated in which Muslim becomes the other. Uh, I would replace my phrase Rakshasa with exotica. Muslims might have an attraction because of that exotica, exotica uh, figure. Uh, of course, uh, second thing, uh, is that uh, transcendentalism is not so much emphasized in my paper. What I emphasized is how, because of the saints' intervention within the common life of people, uh, they are elevated. It's more not because of their philosophy or because of their ethical positionings, but because they are successfully able to 
intervene within the day-to-day -day lives of people that they are venerated. It's not a grand philosophy in particular. Most of the people do not know to which silsila they belong or to which, you know, super tradition they belong to. Uh, they are just interested because these uh, saintly figures are handy, close by, and they feel that they will be more successfully able to intervene in their misfortunes. This is uh, uh, what I wanted to point out. Uh, first point which you raised was why is only a few people were picked up out of so many. So many soldiers were killed. The immediate thing which was, which helped, which might have helped in their uh, well, no, just a minute, just a minute. It's not so much uh, why only so many, but instead a certain religious binary, okay. Why only a Muslim is picked up against uh, no, majoritarian probably community, which must have been there, probably, no, protecting. Yeah. Maybe uh, because of the first point which I raised, that the timely construction of a tomb over, over, over their death. Maybe because of that. But it's, it's, it needs needs rethinking, needs rethinking, I'm not clear. But it might be because uh, they were more resourceful, the coming invading army was more resourceful and they had a typical conception of history. Means whenever someone dies, they try to make tomb over it and maybe because of that custom in, in, in their culture. But I'm not very clear about it. It's a mysterious process. Why, why certain people are picked up? Why others are not? Yes, talk, talk about it. Those who are uh, worshipping in their images by who are slaughtering your community and still you are worshipping to that hero or warrior, it's really pathetic for our community. Still, I want to ask one question. How you can relate these all things with basic Islam and Islamic history? like uh, <coughs> Shia and Sunni and uh, after the death of three Khalifas and after the beginning of fourth Khalifa, Ali, these all Muharram and shrines started. Basic Islam never accepts these all shrines in our country wherever are they. Though in entire country from Kashmir to Kandam Kumari you will find so many shrines. But no shrine is accepted by basic Islam. They never went to Islam, they never bow before these shrines. There only gathers, Hindus gather there. This is my observation. How you will correlate these all things with basic Islam? <coughs> Sir, I don't agree with you that uh, for a long, large part of history there were uh, nomenclatures like Hindus and Muslims. First thing is that uh, the invaders were not, uh, most of the time they were not known as Muslims but rather as Turks, as Mughals, as Mongols, etc. Ethnic affiliations were more important as compared to religion. So conflict was between Rajputs and Turks, between uh, Marathas and, and Mughals, not as such between Hindus and Muslims. Hindus and Muslims are very recent, recent affiliations. Second thing, uh, uh, Islam spread not by the soul, as is usually supposed, yeah. but yeah. by the work of Sufis. Sufism, yeah. And the freelancer yeah. saints, which came with uh, the armies, of course, yeah. but they got integrated into the popular culture. It's a misconception that, you know, Aurangzeb or yeah. somebody else helped in spreading of Islam. It's not like that. It, uh, it was never like that. And there are so many communities in Islam which we are unaware about such as Ismailis, Khozas, such as Kaim Khanis, which sit very close to the communities living close to them. And there are so many exchanges. There is such a rich diversity of exchanges between them that one is just surprised to find how we can create such big homogeneous categories like Hindus and Muslims, keeping in view of these interchanges and interactions. This is my point. So you, uh, this all, uh, our researchers like you, if you all are saying that Islam is not spread or it is not propagated by sword and... Islam is a very large one. No, no, no. I, what you were saying that like Islam is not spread or it is not propagated by sword but it is propagated by Sufis. Mostly. Then uh, how we can deny all historical uh, proofs 
and uh, sources which their own Al Sultanata and Mughal period books, the resources, their two autobiography kind, shows. Two kinds of arguments. First thing, the kind of history we have now was propagated and championed by, uh, by colonialists. By the the second, second, point, the second point, the, source, the Islamic sources which we are relying on are hagiographies. Hagiographies mm. means you just exaggerate certain actions because you are living with the, the king or the sultan. But it doesn't always mean that things happen in the same way which are written in the hagiographies. So be, beware. Hagiographies are not histories, remember. This they is the double standard. This is the double standard. When you show that in Hindu scripture, this is this has been written, it is true hundred percent. And when we are showing that Islamic books are written this, you are showing it is exaggeration. I was always questioning, okay. even questioning the Mahabharata and Ramayana. Hmm. Oh, Doctor, yeah. now we are, we are deviating from the topic. Can we go on to the next question? History is subjective. History is subjective. I think history is a subjective yeah. process. Yeah. Yes. Please deviate. And you know, what is, what is contradictory uh, as far as mythological, uh, mythology is concerned, that in Indian religion, if it is uh, Hindutva as a broad category, Hindu as a broad category, then the otherness is not a binary category because if in uh, in uh, epics if you find ravana or a, any any person who is uh, known as quote unquote evil they are not evil actually they are divine agency cursed by some they are bearing some curse and it is a process to redeem their curse and if it is redeemed finally the curse they will uh, join as the divine, large, large divine body, absolute divine body. So the, there is no concept of evil here. There is no concept of water, no watertight compartment of evil and good, God and Rakshasas here. Right? So, and modern, the, the, some historians influenced by colonial historiography and still they are following the same uh, Hegelian mistake that history is divided into three parts. One is ancient, another is medieval, and then, uh, uh, another is modern. And medieval is darkest part of history. That is the invention of Hegelian historiography in Europe. And same Western uh, fault framework we are following those historians which uh, you refer, right? In, you know that even the poor. Uh, explaining, reinterpreting the history, giving the meta discourse on history, particularly Jodhunath Sarkar's uh, uh, Aurangzeb. Jodhunath Sarkar never wrote a uh, Aurangzeb, never portrayed Aurangzeb as a one dimensional figure. It was the some historians who wrote on Jodhunath's argument, they portrayed it uh, like that. Oh, but Masiri Alangiri yeah. is published, you can read any time. Available in our that, we can have this discussion afterwards. In our ancient there was no compartmentalization between evil and uh, deity, divine and evil. Uh, so it's, any a, more it's an invention of the modern history. history, history, history. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. सुफियों ने तो खुद ही शरीयत का उसको उन्होंने रिजिस्ट किया उसपे प्रतिरोध किया उसका शरीयत का मतलब कि जो इस्लाम के कट्टर नेम हैं जिनकी पालना हर मुसलमान को करनी पड़ती है सुफियों ने तो उससे सुफी तो उससे डिब्रेट हुए हैं उन्होंने तो उन निज़मों का पालना करने से मना मना ही की है ठीक है ना सो सुफी जो है, अगर हम बात करते हैं तो मुझे लगता है ये इस्लाम से ज्यादा सूफियों से ज्यादा कनेक्ट करते हैं और लोग क्यों कनेक्ट कर रहे हैं क्योंकि सूफियों का पैगाम भी जो है वो सर्व सांझे सभ्याचार का ही है तो वो फोक माइंड के साथ फोक साइकी के साथ हमारे कनेक्ट करते हैं तो मुझे लगता है कि बस ये मैं करना चाहती थी कि हम इस्लाम को उस तरीके से ना देखें यहां पे इस्लाम में भी मैं सहमत हूं कि सूफी जो है वो उनके अंदर इंटीग्रेशन ज्यादा था लेकिन साथ साथ ये बहुत ब्रॉड जनरलाइजेशन है कि सारे सूफी जो हैं वो सिंथेटिक थे या धर्म धर्म समझ के बात करते थे ऐसा नहीं है मैं नक्सबंदी जो ऑर्डर है वो कट्टर था 
उनके अंदर भी डिफरेंट कैटेगरीज है हमें थोड़ा सा ध्यान रखना चाहिए उस हाँ कुछ लोग ज्यादा कटर थे कुछ लोग कम कटर थे साथ साथ हमें ये भी नहीं बोलना चाहिए कि जैसे मैंने जिक्र भी किया था पेपर में कि इनिशियली जब तक सूफीज आए वो मार्चिंग आर्मीज के साथ आए ज्यादातर या तो उनके साथ आए या किंग के साथ आए और उनका जो इनिशियल ऑडियंस था वो उनकी खुद के धर्म का था धीरे धीरे ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन हुआ है बदलाव हुआ है और साथ साथ वेरिएशन दोनों चीजें हमें साथ साथ इस पॉइंट के साथ साथ ध्यान देना कुछ आपको जानकारी होगी की जैसे जो हम जितने भी सूफी सेल्स रहे हैं वट प्रपोर्शन ऑफ दैम आर फ्रॉम वॉरियर्स दे एंड ऑल्सो uh, अगर uh, जैसे आपने बोला कि वॉरियर्स से सेंट बने तो uh, बहुत आई थिंक ही ऑल्सो आस समथिंग सिमिलर टू दैट कि बहुत सारे वॉरियर्स रहे होंगे ना वॉट वॉट क्वालिटीज डिस्टिंग्विश दैम जिसकी वजह से वो पर्टिकुलर लोग सेंट बने मतलब दे मस्ट बी समथिंग मोर दैन जस्ट बींग वॉरियर बिकॉज बहुत सारे वॉरियर आपने डिफाइन किया कि वो एक सडन डेथ है अननेचुरल डेथ है पर ऐसा तो बहुत लोगों के साथ हुआ होगा पर कुछ ही लोग जो हैं रिवर हुए तो ऐसा वॉट वॉट वॉज समथिंग मोर वो मुझे पेपर में पता नहीं चला है जो इस्लाम के लिए बनता है वो फिर उसको वो सेम बना दिया जाता है उसको जिनकी डेथ नहीं हुई वो आउट हो गए साथ साथ मुझे लगता है कि जियोग्राफिकल पोजिशन भी इम्पोर्टेंट थी इसके अंदर कहाँ पर डेथ हुई और सोशल मेमोरी के अंदर कैसे वो लैच हो गए कैसे वो सडनली दे गोट कनेक्टेड विद द सोशल मेमोरी तो इसका जो सिलेक्टिव नेचर है इट वॉज नीड सो मैनी थिंग्स मैं तो पर्टिकुलरली इंटरेस्टेड हूँ ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन किन फैक्टर्स की वजह से होता है मुझे नहीं लगता है कि सेंट्रली क्वालिटीज बहुत मैटर करती हैं इस ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन के अंदर ऑफकोर्स उसकी एबिलिटी टू इंटरवीन इन द लाइफ ऑफ कॉमन पीपल हाँ मतलब कई दफ़ा तो स्टोरीज आती हैं उनके अराउंड बन जाती है जैसे आई डोंट आई एम जस्ट ट्राइंग टू कनेक्टेड विद जैसे आई नो दिल्ली में अगर हम देखें सो आई यूज टू ट्रैवल फ्रॉम अ रूट तो वहाँ पे आई सो आज शुरू में समबडी जस्ट केम एंड वो कुछ मतलब वो हाँ स्पॉट था कुछ उसका मीनिंग था वहाँ पूजा एंड सडनली यू नो ओवर अ पीरियड ऑफ टाइम यू सी कि वो पूरा एक बड़ा टेम्पल बन गया या श्राइन बन गया ओवर लेट से नेक्स्ट टेन ट्वेल्व ईयर्स तो उसके अराउंड थिंग So I was just wondering ki uh, I don't know whether there were some stories around it. Maybe some initial spark and then something, something to catch on to. Something that people who knew that person, there was something about it which kind of led to that. Much less emotional, maybe, na? Yeah. Much less emotional, maybe. Yeah. 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 Yeah.